Good evening, and welcome to this installment of the Slack Public Lectures. Uh, we're glad to see you here tonight for a lecture by uh, Bill Schlatter on, well, basically how to make movies a billion times faster than those guys with the cameras on their shoulders. Uh, before we start, let me just call your attention to the um, exits of this room. I should make like a flight attendant report to the exits in the room and the exits in the front in case you're working. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, please uh, make a decorous exit in the event of an emergency. Okay, now uh, we come to the subject at hand. Uh, Bill Schlatter is a staff member here at Slack and instrument scientists on the LCLS, which people who regularly attend these lectures will know is the world's first and I think still only X-ray laser in the hard X-ray region. Um, he's a PhD graduate of Stanford in the Applied Physics Department, 2007. Uh, he worked on um, essentially the time dependence of magnetic materials. He then went off to Germany to our sister laboratory, DAISY, in Hamburg and had a position at the University of Hamburg. And he worked there on problems of imaging uh, spins and magnetic materials using the free electron laser that they have there, a facility called FLASH. Now, given the opportunities of the LCLS, he's back here, and we're very anxious to see uh, what he's going to turn up at the LCLS. So for you, he'll explain to you how to make the world's fastest movies ever, and we thank him for his participation. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Michael. And I want to thank all of you for uh, taking the time uh, this evening to come uh, to come and see what we do here at uh, at Slack. Um, it is uh, it's a pleasure to see so many people in the uh, in the audience. Um, so if you didn't catch, my name is Bill Schlatter. I'm a staff scientist here at Slack, and I'm going to talk to you today about what I've been working on actually for a better part of the better part of my scientific career, about 10 years, uh, which is which is this uh, pursuit of making uh, the fastest uh, movies in the world and studying uh, basically what uh, what's really out of uh, sight for most of us, studying the nano the nano world, the nano scale, and in this case, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, magnetism. So uh, as the title of my talk uh, uh, infers here, uh, this is about making uh, movies of magnetic uh, materials. And um, uh, in this case, uh, these magnetic materials are what store the data in uh, the hard disk drives that we rely on for our everyday uh, information. And as we know, data is stored in ones and zeros. And so we have this uh, sort of uh, uh, artistic interpretation of, uh, of what watching these uh, ones and zeros change uh, would look like, but this is uh, this is actually at the heart at, of, uh, of what I want to uh, what I want to get to. So the picture here is of a hard disk drive, and it's probably of the vintage of, uh, of going out to see a drive-in movie, uh, like uh, like you can see on the poster here. So uh, maybe uh, maybe by the end it would show up on a on an iPod or or uh, an iPad or something like that. So. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, by the end, I'm going to talk about making the, the world's fastest movie. And uh, to get there, we have to start by understanding what movies are, how, how we make movies at the most fundamental, uh, simplest level. Well, we need, we need light to make a movie. You can't have a movie without light. Uh, we also need a, a, a subject or object, and in an entertainment movie we'd call that the pro protagonist, but here we'll just call it the, uh, the object. We need something to study, and uh, that something uh, has, to be, um, has to be detected uh, by a, a detector, some, some, sort of, uh, some sort of film, and uh, that uh, we'd like to see uh, the object with some good resolution. A blurry movie is actually not a very fun movie to watch, so we need uh, some sort of a... Uh, uh, a lens to uh, to give us that resolution, and that lens and film together give us the uh, the camera. So we've got the light, the camera, and you can guess it's going to come next. The action, exactly, exactly. We need to actually see something uh, uh, change. We want to look at uh, we want to look at dynamics. We need some action. So it's that it really is that simple, and um, it's kind of amazing. I mean, movies are pretty commonplace today. You can make a movie with your phone. There's actually a movie being made of me right now that'll go up on uh, on YouTube. 
Um, but uh, uh, the uh, history of movies actually uh, starts here at Stanford uh, at the, uh, the, the stockyard around 135 years ago. I hope most of you have seen this picture by now. Um, and uh, this is one of the first, if not the first, uh, motion picture that was ever recorded uh, by uh, Edwin uh, Mybridge. And uh, this, uh, this image is uh, of, of a horse galloping and uh, it actually served a scientific purpose. At that time, before there were movies, no one knew uh, if a horse pulled all four of its hooves off, a uh, off the ground during a full, a full gallop. You couldn't actually uh, sort of uh, recognize that uh, with just just your normal uh, uh, vision, and so uh, this uh, this was the first uh, movie to uh, to capture that uh, in action. Well, we talked earlier about resolution. Well, this movie has a resolution I estimate of around two millimeters. We can see the the reins on the uh, uh, on the head of the horse here, and the frame rate for this movie, the sort of uh, time period between the action, is a twenty fifth of a second, which is a little well a little bit faster, a little bit slower than our normal uh, uh, vision. So, uh, so when we go and, and, and play this back, we can actually uh, play it back uh, slower than it was recorded and we have a, a slow motion movie. And as you can see, I mean, this looks like a real motion picture. You can really see this, uh, this uh, horse uh, galloping along and sure enough, they're all four uh, hooves come off the ground. All right, so that was uh, in 1878, uh, uh, in June of 1878. And uh, by the end of the talk, I'll show you uh, uh, what this looks like um, uh, a few years ago when the world's fastest movie was recorded. Here's one frame of it. It actually only had two frames. <laughs> this is the first one. And, uh, <laughs> But it had a thousand times better uh, spatial re resolution, and and pretty much uh, uh, pretty close to a million billion or times better uh, temporal resolution. And that ultra fast movie is what I want to talk about today, because that's the time scale that we can study the action of uh, of electrons and materials on the uh, on the nanoscale. So what we're really shooting for in making these magnetic movies is to get uh, you know real nanometer resolution with uh, billions of, a billion billionths of a of a second. Uh, uh, time uh, between uh, between frames. So um, uh, so then, what do we uh, ah, see here? If this is not what it's going to look like, it'll look a little different than that. I'm I'm sure. So what do we need then to uh, to make a movie like this? Well. Um, we need, because uh, we want to watch these bits dance, right? And I'll get into what these bits are in a little bit here uh, in terms of memory bits. But uh, what, do we, what do we need to see a movie of, uh, of, of, of magnetic bits? Well, we need to be able to see the bits. We need that light. Uh, in this case, that light's going to be uh, uh, x-rays. Uh, we also need a, a movie camera. Um, and because these things are so small, that movie camera better be a microscope. So we're going to need the lights, the camera, and uh, we're going to need some way to capture that action. And uh, you know, a normal camera just uses a, a shutter uh, to uh, to stop the uh, the light from coming in while the film advances. Uh, there are digital ways of doing this, but uh, when you start to talk about doing it on uh, you know millionths, uh, billionths of second time scales, it becomes very challenging to detect that image and uh, and distinguish between two points in time. And that's uh, that's exactly what I'm going to uh, talk about today. But perhaps the most important thing we need to know is is why we would go through so much effort to, to do something like this. Why, uh, why do we want to see these magnetic bits uh, uh, flip and, uh, and dance around? Well, the reason why is because magnetism plays an important part in our everyday lives. And I think if, uh, if you didn't know this, by the end of this uh, talk, maybe even by the end of this slide, you'll be totally uh, convinced of that. Um, it stores the information uh, that we rely on in terms of you know, music on our portable, mu portable music players or uh, photographs or emails. Uh, it is what's, uh, uh, what's really behind the, uh, the memory, uh, the storage in your, uh, in your computer. So, uh, and, and we want this, uh, this information to come to us faster. We want to be able to record movies faster. We want everything to be smaller. We always want more capacity. So understanding what the limits are of magnetism is right at the heart of that. 
And um, we can see here uh, the number of, uh, of, of bytes that we can store in these devices is really substantial. So uh, portable media players now can, can store as much as 160 gigabytes. I think a, you know, a fairly run-of-the-mill desktop computer will come with a hard drive that's uh, or maybe two hard drives that, that amounts up to two uh, terabytes. And uh, in one rack of a uh, internet uh, uh, server, so this is maybe what an internet server uh, uh, room looks like. This is sort of the the behind the scenes part of the internet, one of those racks can store a petabyte of data, a million gigabytes. So that's an enormous amount of information. And what's fascinating is, is that uh, if you add up the hard disks in personal computers and the hard disks in these internet servers, you come up with about half of the information that's stored at this time. So half of all the information in the world is being stored on these, uh, uh, in these magnetic media. And that's a, that's a growing number. So uh, it's certainly a very relevant uh, 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 technological um, uh, aspect of, uh, of this work. So um, when we think then of this, this magnetism, or think of these, uh, these hard disks, uh, the inf or the, these uh, uh, disks, we think of the information being stored in these bits. And as I said, I'll, I'll get to what those bits are in a second, but essentially they're little, uh, little magnets, in a sense like a little compass uh, needle, uh, on the surface of the, uh, uh, of the disk, which is uh, you know, maybe made of an iron oxide or, or uh, iron or cobalt or something like that. And uh, on there is stored this information. So, if we want to get more information in the same volume, we've got to increase or decrease the size of those bits. So to give you an idea of what the size scales are uh, that we're storing this information on, on, a, on a, maybe some of you remember a five, uh, five and an eighth inch, uh, uh, yes, some people are nodding their heads, floppy disks that we used to play Oregon Trail in. All right, so <laughs> the size of the bit there was actually uh, almost big enough that, uh, that you could see it if, if you had a magnetic uh, vision. That was, it was around 100 uh, micrometers. And to give you an idea about 100 micro right, micrometers, is, it's about the thickness of uh, width of hair. Or um, if, you don't, if everybody has different size hair, then it's about the width of the leg uh, of, of Lincoln's leg in the Lincoln Memorial on the back side of the, uh, of the penny, the US penny. So that's about 100 micrometers. That's pretty small. Um, but uh, that only gives us, I mean, that's pretty small, but that only gives us about one megabyte on one of those disks. And a few years later, this amazing technology here, the three and a half inch disk came around, which had about the same capacity, but was a little smaller. And sure enough, uh, this is only a few tens of, uh, of micrometers. And then, uh, oh, I think it is about uh, 15 years ago, zip disk came on the scene, and we could store like 100 megabytes. It was amazing. There, the size of the, uh, the bit is around one micron. And one micron is pretty significant because um, it's about the size of the, it's about the, the length of one wavelength of, of visible light. So studying things that are harder than one micron uh, requires something other than, than visible light to do. Um, it's also about the size of a red blood cell. And, um, and since then, uh, hard disk drives have really uh, come on the scene. You know, now they can uh, fit into devices that go into our pocket. And there, the bits are actually much smaller. They're on this uh, tens of, of nanometer length scale. So a thousand times uh, 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 smaller than, uh, than a red blood cell. And as we look into the future, uh, the bits start to approach actual uh, molecular uh, length scales. Um, and uh, there is, uh, there's definitely uh, uh, interesting technologies uh, uh, around the horizon. Horizon. So what I'm going to do next is actually show you a flash animation that came out in um, 2005. I was in graduate school when it came out. It took about two years for me to get the song out of my head. And um, it was made by Hitachi Global Storage, who manufactures uh, hard disk drives. And I'm going to switch over to the PC. But before I do that, when you're watching this movie, I want you to think about how the data is being stored. Um, because it, it talks about that. And also, um, what, what does it mean to say that the, the bits are, are dancing? So I'm going to switch over to the PC here, and, and we'll go over to the, to the movie. And here we go. for that. 
that you know. Hey, is that actually a man? It's called the super paramagnetic effect. Super Calla what? Super paramagnetic effect. That's when all the little bits get so crammed together, you lose your magnetic orientation. You flip and lose your data. Well, what can we do? Gotta make more room. But how? Well, I've been working hard and I've found a way. You gotta get perpendicular. Get perpendicular? Think about it. If all your bits stand up instead of lie down, you make more space for new bits. More bits, more data. But how are we gonna stand up? Leave that to me. One, two, three, kick it. And my sisters are up on the floor Hey, check me out! I'm dancing! I'm dancing! The time has come to oh, 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 open the door Yeah, let all my friends in! Let them in! Cause we'll have ten times the capacity Yeah, we will! Ten times the strength and tenacity Get Take it from me, it's no small feat. How come? Well, first off, we need to thicken the dance floor to allow enough room for the bits to sink in. Oh! Next, a magnetic field flows through the head and into the disc, causing the bits to line up perpendicularly. But just how much more room will that make? Well, on today's six gig microdrives, you can store 3,000 songs. Imagine storing 30,000 songs. Whoa! That's over 1,500 hours of music, my little friend. Oh, that's incredible! Yeah, you said it. Get perpendicular. Get perpendicular. Get perpendicular. Get more particular. Get perpendicular. Get perpendicular. Get more particular. Get more All right, so okay, now we have to stop dancing. Um, so 30,000 songs today is actually the, the reality, right? The 160 gigabyte uh, uh, iPod can, uh, can easily handle that many songs. And this perpendicular recording is actually uh, part of regular technology. But, um, uh, but there are, I mean, the same limits of the super paramagnetic effect and so on uh, apply as we keep making even perpendicular bits smaller and smaller. So uh, the actual action uh, in, this, uh, in this movie that we want to capture here is, uh, is these are these bits dancing. So let me uh, first talk about how the bits are being stored. So this is a screen grab from the, uh, uh, the uh, flash uh, animation there. And um, so if anybody thought this was a sewing machine, it's actually a, a magnetic uh, right head. So this is what's writing the data. So this is an electromagnet that can produce a magnetic field. And here's where the actual data is being stored. So this, uh, uh, these are the bits. And um, this is a, a magnetic material. It might be iron or iron oxide. And uh, underneath here, the so-called dance floor is probably actually just a piece of, uh, of glass. So uh, it's a very thin magnetic film. And uh, much like a, a compass needle can point in one direction or the other, we can actually uh, uh, orient uh, the magnetization of, uh, of each of these little uh, uh, chunks of uh, magnetic material in one direction, or we draw an arrow to, uh, to denote that magnetization. I think an easier way to think of it is little bar magnets, right? So if we had little north and south pole bar magnets, uh, then we, we, can, uh, uh, we can kind of fix the, the, the data there in that magnetization. So, uh, so as this uh, right head moves over, it, it uh, sends this magnetic field through the bit, and uh, in the process, it, it flips or switches. And uh, that's the actual uh, dancing uh, that we want to uh, see. Now, uh, there are other ways the bits can dance if they heat up really hot or something like that, um, which we're also interested in. But, uh, but this is sort of what's happening in our everyday lives when we uh, you know, record a, uh, an image or uh, download something uh, from, the, uh, from the internet. This is what happens in our hard disk drive. So our computer actually doesn't see these as little magnets. Our computer really cares just about two things, right? Ones and zeros. So you can think of, of, of these two orientations then as, as the binary code that's saving the information on your, uh, on your uh, computer. 
so what do these bits look like then? Well, if, um, uh, if we look at this slide here, I've got two pictures that were taken with a special type of uh, uh, microscope using polarized light. This is actually a floppy diskette. And uh, these uh, stripes here are the, uh, are the tracks in the, uh, uh, in the diskette. So when the, um, uh, when the right head moves along, it, uh, it, it moves along a certain path. And uh, that path looks straight because this is actually so small compared to the size of the, uh, of the disk. But in between, you can see these dark and light uh, stripes. Well, those are the bits. Those are the ones and the zeros. And you can think of the uh, uh, north and south uh, as light and dark. So uh, that's how the information is stored. And actually, uh, hopefully, everybody here has a, a credit card in your pockets. And if you do, you're actually carrying a little bit of uh, magnetic storage with you. Um, this is what the uh, bits look on the back side of a credit card. Now, um, the resolution of these images is actually kind of poor, right? We can't store many bits on the back of a, a credit card. If this, is, if this is one millimeter, we need them to be uh, much smaller. But that's what we're limited with with this sort of a, uh, a viewing device. So I want to move next then to talk about how these bits uh, uh, flip or dance. And um, so what, uh, what I have here is actually, a, a, we'll say that this is, this is kind of a simulation. So we've got this diskette. Maybe uh, it came out of a, um, uh, a floppy disk that we cut open and took the disk out. And uh, actually, uh, it's direct from the factory. So it's as, uh, as deposited. Nothing is, no information has been written to this disk. It's really a, a, a pure. Uh, 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 un, unwritten specimen. And I have this uh, device here I call the magnet cam that can actually see the magnetization on this, uh, on this disk. And this is what it looks like. So uh, just right out of the factory, it's kind of randomly arranged. There's no order to it. So that may make sense. There's, there's north and south for, uh, uh, for what will be the, uh, the bits. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a movie of, uh, of, of this activity here. So I'm going to introduce uh, the disk, uh, a magnet to the, uh, to the disk. So we're going to put a magnetic field on the disk. And that'll pull all the bits or pull all of the uh, uh, magnets in one direction. And then I'm going to slide it across. And uh, as we're doing that, they're going to change their, uh, their, their magnetization or change their direction. So this is sort of a slow motion simulation of the actual process of seeing uh, this information dance around. And um, so I'm going to play the movie here. So again, we're going to start the magnet on one side and then watch as the magnetization goes to zero in the middle. Uh, so this is one side. All of them are written in one direction. Then we go to the middle, and they're sort of uh, 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 kind of randomly arranged, half equally dark and light, and then on the other side they become mostly dark. But this tells us a lot of information, right? We see that it's not all switching at once. Uh, it switches in patterns. There's a certain length scale that's sort of uh, preferred on, on what size the, uh, uh, the magnetic bits might be or the smallest size they may become. So there's a lot of information here that we'd like to gather because we want to know is when this is done in a very short length scale, what's the fastest that we could flip these bits? Do they behave differently? or uh, um, or do they behave the same? So to do that, we need to be able to see them because, as I said, they're small these days uh, so that we can get all that information together. So we need something that can take pictures of small uh, magnetic bits. And, and what we're going to use for that are x-rays because x-rays, though you may not know this, are really good at looking at things that are small. And the reason why are because x-rays are just light and uh, it's just the wavelength is, is, is shorter. Um, X-rays can also be good at uh, uh, looking at magnetic materials. And uh, I'll show you that in this next slide. But uh, first I want to start by just sort of when you think about an X-ray, I think this is what comes to mind. You think of uh, uh, an X-ray tube like this, which sort of ray sprays X-rays in every which direction. And then um, you have some, uh, some specimen, which might be a hand or maybe your teeth. And um, what you see is, is the... Uh, uh, the shadow here on the uh, on the film, and uh, what gives us the contrast? Well, in this case, your hand has bones, and those bones have calcium in them, and that uh, calcium absorbs the X-rays, uh, absorbs X-rays much more than the, your flesh, which is mostly made of water. And as a result, you can actually see the structure of your bones right through your uh, right through your hand. Okay, so some of, I think this is pretty familiar to most of you. Um, so there's a ring here that I forgot to add. But uh, that absorbs as well. So if we think of a magnet now, and I uh, um, have a magnet here, the same magnet I used before, this is a horseshoe magnet that has an equal thickness all the way around. So there's no, uh, you know, it, it's equally thick. It should absorb x-rays uh, equally. So we should get a nice even pattern. 
And um, if I illuminate it with x-rays, uh, actually if those x-rays are s a specific color or, uh, or energy, that's not what I get. I see this. I can actually see that uh, there's more absorption here in the magnetic uh, north pole uh, of the magnet uh, than in the, uh, than the, the, the south uh, magnetization of the magnet. So I can actually use x-rays to see the north and, uh, and, and the south. Uh, in the uh, in the magnet, or which direction the uh, the magnet is uh, is pointed, and um, this is uh, this is not something you could actually do with this uh, this sort of an X-ray source you have at the dentist. You need a special uh, type or color of X-rays, um, but we can generate those today using uh, synchrotrons, and uh, it looks like this. Actually, they're a lot bigger; they're uh, a few hundred. Uh, 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 meters usually in uh, in diameter, um, but turns out we have one here at Slack. It's called the uh, Stanford Synchrotron uh, uh, Light Source, and um, it's uh, it's right on the other side of uh, right on the other side of the hill. So this is a great picture of it. Uh, you can see the ring here, and we can use this to. Um, uh, to take pictures uh, of, of magnetic materials uh, using uh, using the X-rays that it produces, but usually we do this uh, uh, not in the the form that I did before. We want to look at things that are small, uh, and so we need a microscope. And um, this is a, a microscope that I think uh, comes to mind uh, from uh, from maybe middle school. Uh, it has a uh, you have some sort of a sample you put here, like you know a cheek swab or something, and then uh, there was light that illuminated it from below. There's an objective lens here, and then an image appeared in your eye when you looked down into it. Well, an X-ray microscope is actually uh, quite similar. So, in this case, our object's going to be a magnetic material, and um, uh, we're going to have an imaging lens. And when we illuminate it with X-rays, that imaging lens is actually going to take um, the uh, uh, the actual uh, um, shape or structure of this magnetization and uh, and image it onto a detector, but enlarged. And so that's what an X-ray uh, microscope does. And this is a way that we can actually see magnetic um, materials today. The problem is, is that, um, well, the resolution is a bit limited. Here are some images that have been taken with X-ray microscopes over time. And you can see we're getting pretty good at, at making X-ray images. This is a two micrometer length, length scale here in 2002. And there are actually magnetic bits all the way down this, uh, this image, but it gets harder and harder to, uh, uh, to see them because the, the resolution of the X-ray microscope is limited. And the reason why is maybe not so intuitive. The reason that the, the, the resolution is limited is because the lens is actually not, uh, um, not perfect. And it's very, while we do have x-ray lenses, they are, um, they're completely inferior to what we have at optical wavelengths. And so, um, um, so it limits the resolution. It also absorbs a lot of light. If we really want to make very high resolution images, we're going to need to uh, go to a lensless uh, microscope. And um, so uh, uh, what I think of uh, lensless, I think of uh, holography. I don't know how many of you think of holography as being a lensless technique, but uh, um, that's actually how we're going to do this. We're going to do uh, holography. So I think you're all conjuring up a mind of a hologram that you may like. Uh, this may be uh, it. So here you can see uh, Obi-Wan and uh, Luke talking to uh, Leia. Um, but in fact, this is probably, I'm pretty sure it's not a hologram. This is a special effect. Um, not even um, uh, Tupac's recent, re recent appearance was a hologram. That was also a special effect. Uh, this is a hologram. This is a very classic hologram. It was uh, on the cover of, uh, of Life magazine. And um, uh, you can see it today if you go to the, uh, there's a museum at, uh, uh, at MIT where it, uh, where it exists and you can, you can look at it. It's very neat because you can actually see things, it looks, it appears to be in, in 3D. But um, that's not necessarily true of holograms. There's some things I want to tell you about holograms before we get uh, going into holography. And uh, the first one is that lasers make holography easy. So before there were lasers, some people tried to practice holography, but it was pretty crude. So it was lasers that really made holography uh, 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 an easy technique to, uh, to do. Holograms don't actually have to be uh, 3D, or they don't have to reconstruct in 3D. So that may be a little bit of a disappointment, since we really like everything in three dimensions, but you can actually make a two-dimensional uh, hologram. Um, and of course, we can make movies with holograms. So, uh, so they, they're, they look like a good recipe for, uh, for helping us to, uh, to capture the, uh, the, the camera part of our, uh, our movie. So I'd like to compare a little bit how a photograph is made to how a hologram is made, because the outcomes are pretty similar, but the processes are, are fairly fundamentally uh, different. So 
with a hologram, you start with, uh, or excuse me, with a photograph, we start with an object. This object here is the Brandenburger Tor, which is in Berlin, uh, Germany. I've done a lot of experiments there. And so it's a familiar thing to go and see and take a picture of. And uh, in photography, we have some object. We take a picture of it. And on a film camera, that picture is recorded on what's called a negative. It's the, the film in the back of the camera. And if any of you have looked at a negative, it, it actually looks like it has the same shape as the image. You can see he, that's clearly the Brandenburger Tor. It's just the colors are wrong, right? So they have the same, uh, they have the same uh, representation. And then it's developed onto a piece of paper, or uh, and now I guess we can, we can do it with a, a computer. There are a lot of different ways to, uh, to do this. But uh, in a sense, all the process is, uh, is sort of reproducing the same, uh, the same structure. And a hologram, that's, that's really different. So if we take the object in a hologram, it looks like this, we would record it by shining a laser on it and then having um, some sort of a, a film that's probably very similar to the film here in place. But you can see the hologram doesn't look like the image at all, right? Or the object at all. It looks completely different. It has these fringes. And these fringes are what, uh, what record the information that, uh, that makes the hologram work without, uh, without lenses. So when we go to reconstruct the hologram or develop it, uh, what we do then is just shine a laser onto the hologram, and that's how you see an image like this. If you go to a museum and look at a hologram like this, they're usually illuminating it uh, from a laser somewhere, and you're just looking at the scattering off of this uh, hologram. So I have a little uh, uh, demonstration now. Um, to show you this representation of, uh, of uh, um, holography. Actually, what we're going to do in this demonstration is create the simplest uh, hologram. Um, but I need to uh, show a few things first. So Perv is going to help me out. If we can turn the lights down. So we're going to use a, a, a laser here, and we're going to shine this laser through a, um, a pinhole. And um, the laser is going to go through a 150 micrometer pinhole. There's a, a lens after it, an objective. And what you see here on the wall, is a, a spot, right? It looks like this. If you can't see it, it looks like this. It's very sharp on the edges. So all I've done here is create a microscope. I'm enlarging a hole and projecting it onto the wall. It's about a, it's about a, um, a thousand times larger. So that's pretty cool. But now if, um, if we take that lens out, we take the lens out of this microscope, which a perva will do now, you see something different. You see this. and. Um, uh, I've got another picture of it here in case you can't see it there. It's not so sharp or well-defined anymore, right? It has kind of soft edges. Well, um, this is what we call a, uh, a diffraction pattern. And actually, if this laser were brighter, this laser is only times brighter than the laser I have in my hand. If it were like a, a hundred times brighter, then this pattern would actually look like this. We would see a whole bunch of rings. Um, but these are not holograms. So uh, to make the crudest hologram, we're actually going to need two pinholes. So Aperva will switch this over, um, since I have a setup with two pinholes here. And actually, you can, you can do this at home. You can take a, a laser pointer. It doesn't have to be a special laser like this one uh, here. A laser pointer will work just as well. And uh, you can poke two holes in aluminum foil. That's what I did. You can tell this is a homemade uh, pinhole setup because they're not perfectly round. So if you go home and they're not perfectly round, it's fine. Um, and we put the same lens after it. So we're imaging, again, this microscope. OK, so two holes, they look like this. Now we're going to take, um, take the lens away. And what you'll see is actually the simplest hologram that you can generate. So there it is. You can see the fringes. And if you can't see it there, you can see it uh, right here. So these, uh, these fringes that you see are, uh, are actually occurring because the light's traveling through both of these holes. Light is acting like a wave, and it's interfering. So this is an interference pattern. And um, uh, this is a very simple hologram. You can see here the fringes actually go completely dark, or nearly completely dark in the middle. And they're very bright uh, in between. So uh, OK, that's, that's great. Uh, but what are we going to do with this hologram? OK, so we can turn the, uh, the lights on now. Because we want to turn this hologram back into an image of those double pinholes, right? We want to reconstruct the hologram. So if, um, if the laser had just been invented, you know, we'd go, we'd develop this hologram, we would, uh, or excuse me, we would record the hologram then, we would have it on an image plate, those fringes on an image plate, and then we would uh, shine the laser uh, through that image plate, and uh, uh, you would see the reconstruction on the wall. So it would be pretty cool. But that would be kind of time consuming. So instead, we're going to try to just do this with, uh, with math. And um, there's a, a very common mathematical uh, calculation called the uh, Fourier transform. 
that we can use to, uh, to do everything that we would do in this, uh, in this reconstruction uh, technique. And um, in fact, actually, it's, it's so common uh, today that uh, there's an app for it uh, for your iPhone. <laughs> and so, um, so I downloaded this app. Uh, I was pretty impressed with this because when I was a graduate student, the app didn't exist and I had to do the calculations on my computer. So, and then I took a picture of this fringe pattern. Now actually, this, this fringe pattern here is a little bit different than the one I had there, but uh, there it's, 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 it's quite similar. So in this app then, you can take this, uh, this Fourier transform, which is a calculation that's used for all sorts of other things in, uh, in technology for communications and, uh, and image processing and so on. And um, you, can, you can calculate this transform and what you get is this. And this is exactly what we would get if we reconstructed this hologram using a laser. Okay, I can see a little bit of disappointment because there's more than two holes. It's okay. This is the simplest or crudest hologram, so it takes a little bit of work to coax an image out of this, but that's what I'm gonna show you uh, what we're going to do uh, next. So to do that, actually, I'm gonna put this under ideal conditions. We're gonna go through some simulations here, and uh, in these simulations, on the left, we always have the object that we're looking at. In this case, it's the same experiment that we just did, two pinholes. In the middle, we have the hologram itself. You can, you can maybe see the fringes there, but you see the rings, and uh, on the right, we have the Fourier transform, this two-dimensional Fourier transform of the hologram, uh, which are these uh, three dots here. And those three dots look uh, quite a bit like what we saw in the, uh, in the previous image, right? So where's the image coming from? Well, if I make two little red uh, circles over the, uh, over the two holes that I'm trying to image here, and then slide them over, I'll show you where it's supposed to appear. One's in the middle and one's on the right. And um, the one on the right is the one we're going to pay attention to. The image here on the left actually is there because there's a, a symmetry to this, and I guess I could cover it up, but I wanted to kind of keep this uh, real. I didn't want to sort of uh, uh, candy coat it too much. So, uh, so this one we don't have to pay attention to, but watch the one on the right, because that's where the image is really going to show up, okay? So now we have a little bit different situation. We still have two pinholes, but one pinhole is really small. So over here, I've enlarged the, uh, the image. I've got one small pinhole, one large pinhole. And you see the pattern here. The fringes are a little bit weaker than in the previous one. And then I take the Fourier transform, and you see the two, uh, or you see the image uh, over here of, of the large pinhole. And if you don't believe me, let me show you how that, that works. So here are the two circles. I'm gonna slide them over. And uh, voila, the one on the right here is, uh, is the image. All right, so these are kind of the simplest uh, examples. Now I'm gonna go to a square. So I've got a tiny hole next to a square. All of a sudden my hologram really starts to look different, right? It doesn't have round features anymore. It has square features. And there's still some fringes here. And uh, now lo and behold, there is a square on the right side here. So I'm, I'm taking an image of a, of a square, okay? All right, so uh, now let's try to build up something that's a little bit more random because we've done these uh, very predictable shapes. So tiny hole here, I have some sort of a funny geometric shape here. This is the hologram that I would generate and then I take the Fourier transform or the two-dimensional Fourier transform and uh, here you can see the, uh, the image on the right. And uh, I can actually build this up a little bit more. Here's another one with a little bit more shape to it. And um, here's actually using the, uh, the object that we made the first, uh, 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 the movie in, or explain the movie in earlier, and uh, you can see I can create an image of this, uh, of this object. So if you can carve this into aluminum foil, you can go home and, uh, and make, this, uh, make this hologram at, uh, at home. All right, so this is exactly what we're gonna do then with, uh, uh, with our x-rays. So if I put this, uh, this system into, uh, uh, this sample into this geometry, so here's the x-rays. I'm gonna illuminate the, uh, the sample here with a hole. And then we've got our object. This is the hologram. And surprise, surprise, we get uh, the uh, Fourier transform. Oh, oh, I lost the joke. Okay, hold on a second here. Let's, let's rewind in time. Little, little slide shock. Okay, so this little object here is not, is not random. Some of you uh, who've been to Berlin may have, have seen this guy. Uh, he's uh, in, in East Germany or East Berlin, he's on the, the, the uh, crossing lights. So when you walk across the street, he's the one that gives you permission to walk. And his name is Ampelbenschen. And uh, that means like little man that allows you to walk across the street or little man traffic light. So uh, in this case, he's our sample. And so we'll call him the Samplebenschen. So, <laughs> all right. 
Okay, so now when we take the, this time, there we go, there's the Fourier transform, there's the reconstruction, and the little uh, sample mention is walking uh, right along. Okay, so to recap, we've talked about magnetism, uh, why it's important, we've talked about how we can use x-rays to see magnetic materials and to see things that are really small, and we've talked about uh, holography and how we can actually use holography to create images without using a uh, uh, without using a lens. So we're going to put all those things together now and do uh, magnetic X-ray holography. And um, this is uh, this is an image here of an actual uh, uh, X-ray hologram. So I've got X-rays that are illuminating uh, the sample, and there's a little magnetic sample inside this hole. And uh, this uh, this image here is no longer a, uh, a simulation. This is an actual uh, uh, hologram that's recorded with the magnetic sample here, and another hole drilled right next to it to produce these. Uh, uh, fringes and uh, actually recorded this data in 2004. It was a really um, it was a really exciting time because we were uh, we were right on the the brink here of creating the first uh, lensless uh, uh, X-ray image. And uh, if we look at this uh, hologram, you can see the nice fringe pattern uh, that uh, that we saw before. And now when I take the uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, from this from this actual data, you can see the two-dimensional Fourier transform gives me the reconstruction of the magnetic material. So these are those uh, magnetic domains that we've uh, we've seen before. So this was a big step. Uh, I mean, we'd seen domains like this before, but we'd never actually been able to image them without lenses, or we didn't have a good path for imaging with higher resolution uh, without using uh, without using lenses. But you know, this was eight years ago. This was just a, a small step on the direction to making a movie because, in a sense, we were just getting our camera working. And what we want to do is uh, is actually uh, uh, capture some action. So we've got X-rays, holography, magnetism, and now we want to see what time scale this magnetism is uh, is behaving on. So to relate what that time scale is, because it's to think of a millionth, of a billionth, of a second, uh, or a femtosecond is a little bit uh, of an unnatural thing to do. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you right away that magnetism, uh, the ch dancing of these bits, the flipping of, of, of mag magnetic materials at its fastest, uh, we believe occurs on this, this time scale here between femtoseconds and picoseconds. So to give you an idea of how fast that is, um, I'd like you to think about the speed of light and how far light travels uh, a given distance. So you've probably heard of a light year before. That's the distance light travels in a year. It's really far. Um, we all know that the, hopefully you know, the speed of light is uh, around 186,000 miles per second. So in one second, uh, if I were to shine this laser uh, up at the moon, uh, probably would, would be a little bit uh, uh, diffuse by the time it got there, but it would take the light about a second uh, to go from the Earth uh, uh, to the moon. So that's one light second. So going a thousand times uh, closer, a thousand times uh, shorter is a millisecond. And uh, a millisecond is about the time it takes light to go from here to uh, Lake Tahoe. So from here to, uh, here to Lake Tahoe. So that's a pretty reasonable distance. That's one millisecond at, uh, at light speed. All right, so, uh, so then a thousand times shorter than that is one microsecond. And uh, if you came in late, your car is parked probably about one light microsecond away. So that's a millionth of a, uh, of a second. All right, so then, um, then I think some people say sometimes, oh, I'll get that done in a nanosecond. Well, hopefully what they're going to do is closer than one foot away because light travels about one foot in a nanosecond. So now a nanosecond becomes sort of on a very uh, human scale, right? One foot is very, uh, is very something I, I'm very comfortable with, one foot. That's one light nanosecond. So a thousand times shorter than that is uh, a picosecond. And uh, here we go with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Lincoln's leg again. Light travels across Lincoln's leg, which is a couple, about 100 micrometers, about the thickness of a human hair, in one light picosecond. And then uh, as we approach a, a femtosecond, then light is actually traveling only about one wavelength of light, uh, which is about the size of one red blood cell, as we talked about before. So uh, a thousand times shorter than that is an attosecond. And uh, in an attosecond, the light's traveling less a thousandth of a wavelength, so we'll have to switch to a shorter wavelength light, so we'll use x-rays, and there the light's just barely traversing a molecule of water. So you can see these time scales are really fast, because we think of light being very fast, but, uh, but light's barely traveling uh, the distances that we're, uh, we're interested in studying. So, so to do these, um, 
So to do these experiments, then, we need uh, uh, light pulses that are very short, that are femtosecond uh, uh, duration. So a flash of light that's only a few femtoseconds. And we also need light that uh, is x-rays, because uh, I showed you we're going to need x-rays to do imaging. And uh, this uh, imaging technique that we use, the holography, works really well with lasers. So an x-ray laser would be really great to have. And uh, it turns out now for uh, a little over two years at Slack, we have a, an X-ray laser. It's called the Linac Coherent Light Source. Um, and uh, it is the first hard X-ray uh, free electron laser in the world. And uh, it's here at Slack. And actually, there are, I uh, just want to say something, there are actually two hard X-ray lasers in the world now. Uh, there's one that turned on in Japan a few months ago. So uh, there's some, some uh, some competition. So we have two X-ray lasers in the world. And um, so this is Slack, and uh, this is the 280 here, uh, Sand Hill Road, and then Alpine's over here. And um, hopefully you're familiar with this very long building. The, uh, the linear accelerator sits underneath this uh, building. And we actually use this linear accelerator at Slack. Uh, which has been running now for 50 years. For the last few years, we've been using it to make x-rays. So we use the last third of it. We eject uh, electrons a little bit down from the freeway here, and they're accelerated to a few giga electron volts of, uh, of energy. And then they're sent right along here. They're kind of, they drift through here. They kind of meander through here. Woo. And then they get to this hill. And this is really important because underneath this hill, there's a tunnel. And in that tunnel, there's a series of permanent magnets that are about this big. And there's a few thousand of them. And as the electrons move in there, they shake back and forth in this magnetic field. And in the process, it's, it's pretty violent, I would imagine. They rattle off uh, x-rays. And those x-rays that they create are actually uh, laser-like. So they travel uh, underneath the, uh, the hill here through the ground into this, which is the near experimental hall. This is where we do the experiments. And then there's even another experiment hall here called the far experimental hall uh, that's uh, in a cave underground uh, um, a few hundred meters from the uh, source. So the special part about the x-ray laser are, is this array of magnets. It's called the undulator and it sits in uh, uh, the undulator hall. We're good with naming here, very descriptive. So the undulator hall. and. Um, this is one of the undulators. The magnets are inside here. The electrons move down here, and they begin their conversion to x-rays. And by the end, we have uh, an x-ray laser beam that comes out the end. That x-ray laser beam uh, goes into our, uh, our experimental uh, uh, setup. So uh, here's the experiment that we're going to use uh, to record this uh, uh, hologram. It was built up by uh, um, some of my colleagues, and actually there are students that will help answer questions later that uh, help put this, uh, this together. And the x-rays come from over here, they're focused by this mirror, and they're sent into this, uh, into this chamber where we have the, uh, the magnetic samples and also our, uh, our, our detector. So um, uh, the experiment, though, we're actually not uh, in the next to it when we do it. We actually, it, it's quite, a, quite an endeavor. This is a movie that requires many people. Here you can see this is in the control room across the hallway where we're actually recording the, uh, recording the data. So this is uh, uh, the first uh, x-ray uh, hologram that was recorded with a single pulse of x-rays from the uh, uh, from the laser, the first hologram of a magnetic material. So this pulse comes from the x-ray laser. Uh, it is, uh, say, around 80 femtoseconds in duration. So we know what uh, femtosecond now is, 80 femtoseconds in duration. And it has uh, about as many x-rays in it as we would get in one second at a normal uh, x-ray source. So there's lots of x-rays that are compressed into this. And it's traveling just like a, uh, a pulse from a laser would. So it, it enters our sample, and uh, we get a hologram that uh, uh, looks pretty similar to what, uh, what we saw before. So for the first time now, we can actually capture, well, one frame of our movie. Uh, and uh, this is the reconstruction after uh, taking the Fourier transform. And here you can see the little uh, magnetic uh, uh, domains. So to make a movie, though, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to get more than one frame, right? And uh, as I alluded to at the beginning, uh, what I would talk about here is the world's fastest movie. And uh, this movie is inspired by uh, trying to, to look at magnetic materials, but we need to first demonstrate that our our, our movie making technique uh, is actually going to work. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to look at something that's uh, that's somewhat static. So we've got the two pulses coming from the X-ray laser that are delayed by some time that's very short probably a few hundred femtoseconds, maybe a picosecond. So remember, uh, a picosecond is, um, is, uh, is the time uh, uh, that, uh, if we go back, oops, 
here, picoseconds is the time it takes for light to go across Lincoln's leg. So this light, this X-ray pulse, uh, is actually shorter than the, uh, the extent of, uh, of, of his leg. So it's very short pulse of, uh, of light. And we've got these two pulses that are slightly delayed, and they're going to overlap on the, uh, uh, on the detector. And that's the problem, because when we detect both of these images, or we detect both of these pulses, we're not going to be able to read out the camera fast enough before the second pulse arrives. And so they come, and they overlap on top of each other. And so that's the, that's the big problem to making the ultra-fast movie. So, the trick around that is actually to use uh, holography. And that was what was done by some of my colleagues uh, around three years ago while I was in uh, Germany at, uh, uh, at Flash. Um, they did this experiment. And so this is a holographic uh, object. This is an object we're going to take a, a hologram of. And the sample here is, uh, is, is probably the smallest uh, uh, version of the Brandenburger uh, tour that's, that's ever existed. It's very tiny. It's, it's about the size of a human hair. It's about 100 microns across. And so we're going to illuminate this, uh, this object with, uh, with one pulse. And so I'll, this first pulse is going to illuminate it. And it's only going to illuminate this hole, this reference here, the one down here, and the sample. So if we go back and watch this again, there it was. And the second pulse is going to come. And it's steered so that it only illuminates the sample and these two holes. So now we've got two pulses that are illuminating different parts of the hologram, but they're both illuminating what we want to study. They're both illuminating the object. All right. So uh, they actually had more than three holes. They had around 12 holes. But, uh, but you can just pay attention to the, uh, to the inside here. So we just illuminate the, the left side of this uh, uh, this sample. This is the hologram we get, and this is the transform. There's just tons of copies of this uh, Brandenburger tour because there were so many. There were so many holes. But just pay attention to uh, to say this one right here because this one uh, will will sort of extract and put on our our film for our first frame in the uh, in the movie. So the second pulse comes along a few fifty or so uh, femtoseconds later, and it illuminates the right side. So here's the hologram from that one, and uh, here you can see the. Uh, uh, the reconstruction. Now, these pulses actually didn't come sequentially. In this example, they were just sort of uh, testing things, and they just illuminated one side and then illuminated the other side uh, independently. And that's why you can actually see the images are uh, a little different. So this image appears here, but just barely appears here. And this one appears here, but there's no image, uh, well, there's barely an image here in its place on the, uh, on the other side. So then we extract one of the Im these images, and that makes the second frame in our, uh, in our movie. So then when they come together, um, now actually we're going to use two pulses. Then the holograms overlap. So this is uh, basically two holograms on top of each other. But that doesn't matter because the information that's here in these fringes, it all sorts itself out once we take the Fourier transform. And so now, these images here that are, uh, that are in kind of the, uh, uh, the red, the red ones, were the ones from the first pulse, the pulse on the left. And the ones that are in the green or bluish here are the ones from the second pulse, the ones on the right. So we've actually taken a two-frame movie of an object that didn't change, but, uh, but nonetheless, it is actually a movie. And, uh, and, and that was verified by none other than the Guinness Book of World Records, who certified this as the world's fastest uh, movie uh, last year. So there's no question that this is the real, the real deal. But two frames is... Two frames is probably uh, you know, not enough to get all the information we want to gather, although it actually would be really helpful. So what we'd like to do in the future is to, 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 to use basically many pulses to illuminate a sample. And uh, here you can imagine this is the, the horse uh, uh, that we saw from, uh, from the beginning. And if we have one pulse that illuminates the top, then we get one image, and a second one that illuminates uh, this hole the second image and so on and so forth all the way around, you can imagine this is like this is like a picosecond or femtosecond stopwatch. We can actually watch this action in, uh, in time. So we haven't done this yet. This requires equipment that we, uh, we hope to build. But, uh, but you can see the idea of, of making these movies is, uh, uh, is very powerful. And so 
I'd like to talk uh, at the end here just about uh, uh, the applications of this. Well, I've talked a lot about magnetism, so clearly we want to look at, uh, at magnetism and watching uh, magnetism switch. And one of the most exciting things in magnetism today is actually that we can switch uh, a magnetic material not using a, a magnetic field like on a uh, uh, hard drive right head like we saw earlier, but just with a uh, polarized optical uh, laser pulse. And uh, this actually happens on the uh, femtosecond, picosecond time scale. So we'd like to capture uh, that in action because this is a very uh, uh, exciting technological uh, advance and uh, uh, understanding how that magnetism is actually uh, being influenced by the, uh, the optical laser would be really, uh, would be really helpful to, to know more of. So uh, what we would see there is, uh, is a movie a lot like what we saw before, what we anticipate to see, a lot like we saw before in sort of slow motion, um, but, uh, but we don't know exactly what it'll, uh, what it'll look like. So, so magnetism is, is, of course, interesting to study. But really, this technique is good at looking at anything on the nanoscale, any nanoscale structure uh, that has dynamics that are on that picosecond or femtosecond time scale. And um, magnetism is only one of those things. Uh, if we look at uh, an application to uh, uh, organic uh, solar cells, in an organic solar cell, uh, light from the sun is absorbed in a material, and when that light's absorbed, it uh, takes the electron and splits it away from, uh, uh, well, from the atom that it was closest to. And actually, what we want to try to do is keep that electron from, uh, from, from jumping back into the atom, because if that happens, we can't capture it to make electricity. It just uh, turns into heat. And, um, and in uh, uh, organic solar cells, there's actually a, a, a structure on the nanometer link scale where uh, certain materials uh, are happy to have that electron and other ones are just going to uh, allow it to uh, um, sort of absorb back. And so getting that electron away from, uh, from, from where it was uh, created by uh, the absorption event from the, uh, from the sun is what gives us an efficient solar cell. So understanding the, the nanoscale structure and actually imaging the flow of, uh, of the electrons and of the energy in these solar cells would give us a much better understanding of how they work and hopefully control their um, uh, control their efficiency. So uh, uh, something else that's uh, that's interesting that happens on the nanoscale is uh, chemistry. So chemistry often occurs on surfaces and in interfaces. And uh, in chemistry, you know, you probably remember you start with some some uh, some reactants and then you have some products. And what happens in in the middle is is sometimes kind of a mystery. But uh, but the time scales that uh, the chemistry occur on are also on this picosecond, uh, femtosecond time scale. So if we think of uh, in in catalysis, some very uh, challenging problems are the uh, uh, efficient conversion of uh, of um, uh, carbon. Uh, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and other gases into uh, into liquid fuels, and uh, so this happens on uh, on catalysts that are not too much unlike uh, a metal a nanoparticle like the one here, and uh, it doesn't happen uniformly on these surfaces. It happens more in some spots than others, and so understanding. Uh, you know why it's occurring in some regions more than others, or faster in some places than others, or exactly how the uh, the molecules are attaching to these surfaces and and moving around uh, would be uh, something we'd love to take uh, uh, movies of. And uh, so this would be a great application uh, of this technique to a real scientific problem that uh, I think we'd all find pretty interesting because liquid fuel is pretty uh, is pretty helpful. Um, so, to conclude, I'd like you to, uh, to take home that, well, ultra-fast movies are, are really a challenge to make, um, but we've made really great progress uh, in the last uh, uh, decade, and um, this is an exciting time because now that we have x-rays, uh, now that we have an x-ray laser, we can really start to, uh, to, to make these movies. Before, you know, we were practicing and trying to develop techniques and whatnot, but, uh, but actually having the laser has made this a very exciting time. And uh, these movies allow us to really see nanoscale materials uh, and see them on time scales that are really relevant to, uh, to what's happening. Um, and so we hope to use these, these results then to understand things that are very relevant to our, uh, uh, to our everyday lives, like magnetism, energy, conversion, and, uh, and chemistry. And so like any movie, uh, there are a lot more people uh, involved in making this one than me. And so I'd like to uh, give uh, credit to those that helped. Uh, whoa, this is, this is like a really fast credit, so I'll run it again. Actually, these... <laughs> 
these students, uh, uh, Benny, Catherine, Tehan, um, are, are around and uh, they'll help us run microphones for the Q&A and they'll also uh, be around to, uh, to answer questions. Um, so, uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you and, and kind of leave you with this image here of uh, how movies are made. Thanks. Could you explain what a hard x-ray is? Sure, yes. Great, so the question was, what is a hard x-ray? And uh, actually, I use that term uh, a bit. I may have also used, I, I, I'm not sure if I use the word soft x-ray. Uh, a hard x-ray is a certain uh, color of x-ray, so it's a certain wavelength of x-ray, where the wavelength is about one angstrom. And it depends what kind of scientist you talk to how big that is. So for me, it's about one angstrom. Uh, to an astrophysicist, it might be a tenth of an angstrom. Um, but a uh, hard x-ray has a, has a wavelength of around an angstrom and an energy uh, of around 8,000 uh, uh, electron volts. Say that's kind of the average uh, hard x-ray. And a soft x-ray is, is longer. Soft x-rays behave a little bit more like ultraviolet light. They have a wavelength of around one nanometer or an energy of around uh, 800 uh, electron volts. So they're about a tenth the energy and ten times longer in, uh, in wavelength. And to image magnetism, we like to use soft x-rays because it can really see, it really has good access to that uh, contrast um, for imaging. Great question. There was a question up there. How, how do you get the calls? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you get the pulse to switch to, to illuminate the different areas of the image? Okay, great. So, so the um, question is, and I'm going to go back to, uh, to the slide where this, uh, where this happens here. So, so basically, how do we get the pulse to illuminate the different uh, uh, sides of the, uh, of the object? So we've, got, we've basically got uh, one sample here, and then we're illuminating the left side with one pulse, one pulse in time, and the right side with another pulse in time. And we actually use a, a piece of equipment called a, a beam splitter that divides the pulse and, uh, and separates it, and then we can independently steer each of the, uh, each of the pulses. And I kind of uh, skipped over it because the product of a beam splitter is actually pretty intuitive to understand. It's just two pulses that are lined right up with one another. So that's, and actually I built, uh, I built a beam splitter while I was in, uh, in Germany. It's quite big. <laughs> Yeah, hi. I wonder if you could just elaborate on the physics behind the X-rays being able to um, image the mag mag magnetic north and south. What's, sure. what's going on sure. there? So, so for for X-rays to see this uh, this magnetism, they have to be uh, tuned to a specific energy or color. So, and that color is actually. Uh, um, uh, the color of the x-rays is coincident with electronic transitions in the atom. So in a sense, uh, if you've got the color right, all of a sudden that atom will, will, will start to appear um, because you've tuned it to the atom. Uh, the magnetism comes from uh, an imbalance in the, uh, the spin of the electrons. So the electrons have this quality called spin. It's what gives us the magnetism and there's more of one spin than the other. And so uh, as the x-rays uh, um, are absorbed by the material, uh, the x-rays that I was using that actually have this contrast are circular polarized. I didn't, didn't mention that. But, um, but that, that means that they'll absorb more of one spin than the other. And so in that way, we can actually see the, uh, see the magnetism. And the actual technique is called uh, x-ray magnetic circular dichroism. Um, would this imaging technology be useful for the next generation of computing devices or even quantum information processing? 
so the question was, would, would this, uh, would this technology be good for the next generation of, of uh, computing or even uh, quantum information? Well, certainly, uh, so soft x-rays are really good at seeing the nanoscale, but uh, they're not good necessarily at seeing an individual atom. So, uh, so we might actually move to looking at things with, with hard x-rays if we want to see individual atoms. But I certainly think that um, uh, while it may not uh, be apparent what the direct path is right now uh, to enabling those technologies, uh, I'm certain that uh, uh, the things we understand from uh, you know, the fundamental uh, principles of how these uh, materials behave, uh, how magnetism, for example, behaves, is going to give us some of the pieces of the puzzle to, uh, to advanced uh, you know, uh, quantum computing type uh, elements. And I, I understand that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but I think the direct connection is a little bit, uh, a little bit hard to, uh, to make right now. Probably not. That's true. That's a good point. So we're not, definitely, it's, 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 it's a little expensive to, uh, to, to actually read out data with. Yes. But, uh, uh, but it's excellent for, for studying it. Yeah. Um, I I didn't understand how you how you determine the, these these electrons that are running down and, and ultimately developing into X-rays. How do you get that time differential that that delta T? Yes. Yeah. How okay. do you how do you that's a great question. How do you question. select it? Or so, so, um, so the question is, how do we create this, this time between the two pulses? And actually, that question is very closely related to the previous question about how do we make the two illuminate independently the, uh, the hologram. Well, the beam splitter uh, doesn't only split the beam, but it actually allows us to delay it. So the time scales are actually so short that we can divide the beam and send it you know, a few hundred micrometers more in one side of the, the system than the other. And actually actually generate these delays. So that's one thing that's kind of in our favor is that the, the, the durations are so short that we're dealing with that we can actually physically delay the light. Um, and that's something that uh, pretty magical to see because I think that you kind of treat light as an infinite velocity, but it really is finite. And uh, you know, it really does take nanoseconds for the light to come even between me and you. So these time scales are even, even shorter. They're, they're quite doable to generate in the laboratory. Actually, there's something that's pretty cool imagine you can make pulses. Yeah, you can imagine you can make pulses by sending electron beams down the linac. You send an elect, you accelerate an electron bunch, and every bunch makes a laser pulse. And the technology says you can put those bunches very closely spaced, as we would think, a nanosecond apart. But that's a whole foot. That's much too far to do this experiment. So you have to use the photons that are generated from a single pulse and split them up. And by these minuscule distances, you make enough separation to make this multi-frame moving. Other questions? Sir. Sure. Actually, we need the microphone just because they're recording this. Uh, Sorry. The stairs are kind of. Yep. Weird. Uh, how long between uh, the first exposure and the, and the last one before the sample disintegrates? It explodes? Yes. Yeah. That's a good question. So that's something I didn't address, that uh, often, not always, but often these experiments, uh, when we uh, hit the sample, uh, it actually is not there afterwards. But the second pulse uh, is still capturing it in action. So for things to actually move away, for atoms to actually, you know, for the whole system, first it has to, so first the x-rays come in, the energy is absorbed, that energy has got to be converted to heat, and then that heat needs to start to basically move around or cause stress in the mechanical system so that it explodes. So it's kind of a progression of, of things. And that happens in the hundreds of picoseconds to, to nanosecond timescale. So it's, it's a long time uh, when you compare it to the electrons, which is what we're really looking at here. You have a follow-up. Yeah, uh, this is a different one. Okay. When I was at Max Store, uh, we were looking at the time it took for a magnetic domain to flip. Can, is there any possibility of actually getting you know, a high-resolution image of that Flipping time. Yeah, I, I mean, ideally, that's uh, that's where the you know what we're what we're after here. Um, I think you can you can. I mean, there's information statistically on uh, um, on how that goes, but that's the the, the movie that uh, that we want to make. So, right. Yes. Let's take one more. 
Anyone? Okay, if you're happy, um, there will be people wearing these hats, the students uh, in uh, Bill's group will be down here. Bill will be down for a while. Uh, we're happy to take your questions privately. And other than that, we'll see you um, the fourth Tuesday in July for the next round of this public lecture series. So let's thank Bill. Thank you very much.